I'm really happy to see that we got we got a nice crowd here for uh, our, I think everybody's friend, Bill Hayton, uh, <laughs> who has probably become one of the foremost names on the South China Sea over the last couple of years. Uh, Bill is currently an associate fellow with Chatham House uh, and a journalist with BBC. Um, he's also the author of The South China Sea, The Struggle for Power in Asia, which uh, in addition to being named one of the Economist Books of the Year in 2014, I can say is the best book I've seen on the topic in the last several years at least, and probably the best general history that we've ever had on the South China Sea. Uh, Bill also previously wrote Vietnam, Rising Dragon, which describes the uh, diplomatic, social, political, and economic issues facing modern Vietnam. Uh, today he's here to highlight some of his recent research on uh, the modern origins, perhaps more modern than Beijing suggests, of Chinese claims in the uh, South China Sea. And uh, I'm very thankful to our Southeast Asia program for co-hosting the event with uh, the Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative. So we're going to have Bill uh, give us uh, a presentation and then hopefully open to a very interesting uh, and, and maybe engage Q&A afterwards. So yeah. Bill, please. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Um, thanks to CSIS. It's really nice to be back here. And thanks to you all for coming it's great to have so many people interested in my obscure topic. It's less obscure than it, it used to be. Um, it's, it, it's going to be a bit of a history lesson, but I hope you'll find it sufficiently stimulating. Really, um, uh, this is the fruit of, of, of my research, uh, helped by a few academics, a few sort of disclaimers. I'm not a China scholar. You know, uh, I don't really speak Chinese. I've had help from you know, students and friends and paid translators to do a lot of this work. Um, but I'm very happy to kind of, you know, to engage with people who think I've maybe misinterpreted or, uh, you know, if you've got better understandings. Uh, this is a work in progress. Um, and so I'm, I, I, you know, I really welcome the discussion and, and uh, efforts to find out uh, you know, ever more about this subject. Since Greg mentioned that I work for the BBC, I do need to just say that you know, today I'm not working for the BBC. These are entirely my own opinions uh, and nothing to do with them. And I want to acknowledge the fact that a lot of people have helped me along the way. So why do we care about, or why should we care about the, the history and the, the origins of, of China's claims in the South China Sea? I think there's a view uh, among policymakers and people who write about the subject that somehow China's claims are special and different from other countries' claims because they are more historical. And I think that uh, creates a sort of lens through which people look at the South China Sea issue that somehow China's claims are more virtuous than the, than the others. I'm going to argue that they are just as incoherent as everybody else's. Um, I also want to argue that um, rather than seeing the disputes as inherently unresolvable because they are about matters of which we can't prove facts and so forth, that it is entirely possible to look at the evidence and interrogate the evidence and see whether it stands up. Um, I'm also convinced that underlying everything that's happening in the South China Sea is China's sense of entitlement to the territories, which it gets from a particular reading of history. Um, and that, that particular reading of history gives it a sense of, uh, of righteousness in its actions, and that will inevitably lead to conflict, because I don't think it's going to go away. So I'm concerned about that. So the basic story is that before 1909, official China had absolutely no interest in the rocks and reefs of the South China Sea. And it's a controversial statement, but I think I can justify that. Uh, the first claims emerge in 1909. Uh, 1933, China starts to think about the Spratly Islands, but in a not very organized manner. It's not until the Second World War, really, that the China claim extends as far south as the Spratly Islands. I'll go into that in more detail. Um, my sources are English language newspapers and Chinese language newspapers from the region, South China Morning Post, Straits Times, uh, Shenbao, uh, and some others, uh, mainly written around 1933-34 as a crucial year, plus a few academic works. I'm very happy to share all the copies of all my research material with you all uh, if you are interested. Now, one of the things, obviously, that uh, we often hear is that China's claim goes back to, to ancient times. And there's a particular pattern in the use of evidence by, from the Chinese side, which is to take isolated sentences or scraps of information from historic documents and present them as being concrete evidence of claims. And here's, here's one very good example. Um, 
So from a document that was produced by the Chinese Foreign Ministry as long ago as 2000, it's the kind of, one of the kind of most complete statements of the, the historical claims to China. And in it, they very typically, they, they take a, an old document, the, the Yi Wu Zhu, um, which is about 2,000 years old and has a quote. There are islets, sand keys, reefs and banks in the South China Sea. The water there is shallow with mag magnetic rocks. And this is intended to prove that the Chinese people have collectively known about, discovered uh, and administered the South China Sea quote since ancient times. Now it's important to remember that this document disappeared a thousand years ago. So the, the copies we're working are copies or copies of copies of copies. Yeah? So how, however many you know, mistakes and misinterpretations have been inserted in that copying process, we don't know. But more importantly, if you go back to those original copies, the quote doesn't say what the Chinese Foreign Ministry says it does. So Johannes Kurtz, for example, has written a very good paper, which you can find on, on Academia, uh, looking at some of these old documents and what they actually say. So this is, the, this is what it says. Foreign, and it, the Chinese Foreign Ministry has, has removed the second sentence, which says, foreigners reinforce their big ships with sheet metal. So this is not a statement saying the Chinese were using, were going past this place, but that foreigners were going past this place. But that's removed from the Chinese account. Okay, and also it doesn't mention the word South China Sea, it just talks about the sea. So that's a, you know, a, a gross misuse of, of historical evidence, which we can clearly, clearly see there. Uh, this goes all the way up to the uh, to more modern uh, claims. So there's a claim, for example, that in 1876, the first Chinese ambassador to, uh, to, the, to the UK claimed the Parasol Islands. That's not what happened. He kept a private journal, which he used to then inform the Qing court about uh, the things that he discovered on his voyage to Europe. And in that private journal, he wrote about sailing past the Parasol Islands. Interestingly, he doesn't use the word Sisha because the word Sisha hadn't been invented. Sisha is only coined in around 1909, 1910. He uses the English words Pailasu, Paracel Islands, and it's clear from the context that he's getting his information from his fellow passengers on a P&O cruise ship, the Travancore, on which he's traveling from Hong Kong to London. So, 1897, a map of uh, Guangdong province and Hainan, no need to mark any islands. They're not part of the concern of the Chinese authorities. Really to understand why the claim emerged, one has to look at the political situation in southern China at the turn of the century. Uh, you've just had 1894-5, the Sino-Japanese War, the loss of Korea and Taiwan. You've had the Boxer Uprising and, and suppression of in 1901. Uh, you've had 60 years of unequal treaties, imperialists, uh, Europeans, Brits, everybody uh, taking little bits of China and imposing their uh, authority. Um, and you're starting to get uh, discontent with the Qing. You have four uprisings alone in 1907 in, in uh, Guangdong province and Guangxi province, organized by Sun Yat-sen supporters. Uh, you have anger, for example, the British wanted to impose their own anti-piracy patrols uh, near Guangzhou in 1908. This caused a big reaction and uh, the Society to Commemorate National Humiliation was formed. Um, and there are uprisings and, and, and there's, there's ongoing strife demonstrations, uh, a lot happening in southern Chinese cities at this time. And the territorial claim is basically an official response to show that it's doing something to stand up to the foreigners. That's why it happens in 1909. And the trigger um, is uh, this man in particular. So General Li Jun, he was, uh, he was a, uh, a well, very well-known military figure uh, in, in uh, Guangdong province at the time. Uh, he was responsible for, suppress for suppressing a lot of the uh, uh, rebels' uprisings uh, and was targeted for assassination. He was also uh, alleged to be quite corrupt, as that uh, little um, uh, newspaper cutting implies. Now, in 1909, a Japanese merchant, uh, 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 Nishizawa Yoshiji, is discovered by a Chinese boat to be digging up guano, bird shit, on Pratas Island for use as an agricultural fertilizer. Pratas, if you don't know, it's occupied by Taiwan these days. It's between, halfway between Taiwan and, and the mainland coast. Uninhabited island. Um, now, I think 10 years before, no one would really have cared uh, about a Japanese man digging up guano. But in this atmosphere, it becomes a huge issue. And there are uh, comments in the newspapers about the Chinese mind being very agitated about this, and um, uh, there are demonstrations in the streets. And a boycott 
of Japanese goods is imposed um, and this eventually after several months forces uh, the Japanese government to reach a deal with the Viceroy of uh, Liang Guang. Liang Guang is the two Guangs, Guang Xi and, and Guangdong and Nishizawa. And basically the Chinese authorities pay uh, Nishizawa $130,000 to leave the island and in return the Japanese government recognizes uh, China's claim to Pratas. So this is the very first time that you see uh, China kind of or Chinese authorities using uh, international concepts of international law to try and assert a claim to, a, to an offshore island. And so it's a, it's a really interesting period. Um, and what uh, is really going on here is a sort of sense that the Qing are suffering what one might call these days a legitimation crisis, that they're being accused of not standing up to the foreigners. Here is a moment when they can stand up to the foreigners, and they pay them a lot of money, but they kind of they fly the flag and they, 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 they win the, the dispute. And while all of this is going on, uh, attention is turned to the, um, to the Paris Islands at the same time. And another factor we see here for the very first time is this uh, effort to go back to old documents and find evidence that can be used to assert a Chinese claim for the very first time. Before, nobody cared. Now, with this engagement with international law, there's a sense that you need evidence. And so they go back and find a mention of the island in, a, in an 18th century document and say, look, this is Chinese. And at the same time, the Self-Government Society, one of these uh, uh, local nationalist groups, uh, goes out trying to collect fishermen's testimony to say that fishermen have always been there. This is, again, another part of the process of developing a sense of a historical claim, and it really only begins in this year, in 1909. So there's a sense among nationalists, among educated people, that, that this is rightfully China's, but they don't have the evidence to prove it, so they have to go and find it. Um, and while all this is going on, Li Jun himself, uh, having launched the voyage to the Paracels, so to the Pratas, now organizes a voyage to the Paracels for the very first time. Uh, and a major expedition is launched, three ships, uh, a high range of, uh, of, of dignitaries and 108 um, uh, kind of laborers and people who go. And it's, uh, they have a torrid time because there's a typhoon and they have to kind of stay in harbor. And they spend three days in the Paracels doing the things that imperialists do when they discover islands, sticking in flags and firing cannons and declaring it uh, to be Chinese territory. Um, and it's much heralded. It's given a, it, it, it's, the whole thing is a great media show with regular updates from the voyage. And it's, it's clearly designed to kind of be a, uh, a sort of vote winner uh, for, for, for public consumption. It's very much uh, an attempt to show that the, the authorities are standing up to the foreigners and, and claiming China, Chinese territory properly for the Chinese. And it's one in the eye for the Japanese or anybody else. Uh, so it's very much a response to the domestic political crisis. And the very first time that China claims the Paris Islands formally, 6th of June, 1909. Um, but almost immediately after it happens, the Chinese authorities completely lose interest in the Paris Islands. So uh, within weeks of uh, the expedition, which sent all these giant officials, you see talk in the South China Morning Post that we're going to convert them into a penal settlement. There's no way they're going to make any money as an, an, as an economic proposition here. They're just going to be used to, to house prisoners. Uh, and even that just disappears. And nothing happens for at least 10 years. So Chinese interest in the Paris House disappears after 1909. Of course, you have the revolution in 1911. Um, and after that, it gets even worse. And even so, South China Morning Post from 1920 uh, Europeans complaining that the Paris House is still a death trap. Why doesn't anyone build a lighthouse? Why doesn't anybody take responsibility for it? Now, 1921, there are some murky deals between Sun Yat-sen, based in the south, and Japanese interests, uh, arms in exchange for development rights, that kind of thing. It's still a fairly murky bit of history. Um, but not much else is really going on in the Paris House in the 1920s. But in 1925, um, the French send uh, an expedition uh, to the Paracels for the first time. Um, and this starts to kind of uh, alert the Chinese to the fact that the, um, um, they don't find out for quite a long time afterwards, that the French, being the power in Indochina, are interested in the islands. Um, and at the same time, Japan is uh, increasingly interested in them as well. And this, you get a sort of three-way competition of various sort of um, expeditions, commercial slash state-backed um, uh, enterprises taking place on the islands during the 1920s. Um, it's only really after um, 
the, the formation of a, a, a recognized central government in China in 1928, um, that attention again turns to the Paracels. It's as late as 1928. And Sun Yat-sen University sends an expedition, is given the sort of mandate to be responsible for the Paracel Islands and sends an expedition there in 1928. Um, and the professor who is in charge of it comes, writes a report of what happened, and there's the copy of the report. One of the first things he says is that the Paracels must be protected because they're our nation's southernmost territory, which was quite an assertive statement for the time, but of course now, in retrospect, it's, it seems strange because, of course, China now asserts that the Spratleys, much further south, are its southernmost territory. But back then, it was only interested in the Paracel Islands, as late as 1928. And again, another set of uh, history writing, this guy Chen Tianxi, who's a, a, a Guomindang member, is tasked with writing a kind of history of the Paracel Islands, going back through old documents, finding sentences and things which uh, bolster the, um, uh, the, the, the Chinese claim. A sense that it has to be presented uh, in a kind of legal manner. Now, it's worth just putting this in the context of China's general anxiety about its borders at this time. And this is something I get from William Callahan's book. The very first map of the Republic of China had no borders on it because there was a sense that uh, foreigners had stolen land from China and that it was, an, it was an unanswered question as to where China's rightful borders should be. So, for example, in this map, Korea and uh, Indochina were referred to as formerly our vassal, a kind of ambiguous statement, status. Should we claim them? Should we not claim them? Uh, and a land has obviously been uh, taken in... You know, uh, by the British, by the Russians, by the Japanese. So this ongoing discussion about where China's borders lay, which was not resolved until really uh, after the Second World War. And in the interim, individuals and private organizations and uh, geographers in particular uh, start to try to answer the question in their own way. So for example, there's a whole uh, industry of producing these maps of national humiliation showing how, ch how much land has been stolen from China by the foreigners over the last century or two. Um, I've, I've used this map before. And they list these, these concessions. And you see the line, the blue line, is kind of the idea that this is rightful Chinese territory which is clearly a, um, a sort of a reading of history, which is that these places, for example, the Sulu Sultanate down uh, in, in uh, Malaysia, what's modern Malaysia, Philippines now, um, used to send tribute to the emperor, and so this was rightfully part of the Chinese empire, and maybe it should be part of the Chinese you know, state again someday. Now, the, the islands of the South China Sea, and even the East China Sea in this case, are only really caught up in it because the, of the need to make the line continuous. They're not a specific focus of this, but they become caught up in it later on. So, and that's why this, is the, um, this is the most intense bit of history, and I just thought I'd shove it all on one slide to, to get it out of the way. It's complex, okay? So, October 1928, Chiang Kai-shek's government is established uh, in one central government after the kind of warlord fighting era. Partly, to, well, really to try and resolve these questions about where China's rightful borders are, uh, the new government imposes or, or, or promulgates new regulations saying that all the maps have to be inspected so that they all say the same thing. Now, this in the past has been treated as if it's some kind of um, sub-editing exercise. It was simply a question of tidying up maps. But I think this is absolutely fundamental. I think this process of regularizing the maps was actually about defining China's territory. And it's surprisingly unstudied, this process. And it really needs an expert in Chinese history to go and look at exactly this process. Um, at the same time, of course, you've got the Japanese invading Manchuria, things getting really nasty in the, in the northeast. Um, so it's not surprising that the Chinese government has other things to think about other than the French government uh, protesting against its plans to develop the guano industry and the Paracels. Um, it's also vitally important at the same time that the factions inside the Guomindang, who are opposed to Chang's rule, all converge in the south on Guangzhou and set up a rival Chinese government, the Southwest Political Committee down in the southwest, um, uh, which basically spends most of its time just denouncing everything that Chiang Kai-shek does uh, in Nanjing. Um, six months after the, uh, the, the, the French government claiming the Paracels, the Chinese government rejects the claim to the Paracels. Um, and then shortly after that, uh, sorry, a year after that, uh, they finally get round to actually having a meeting of the MAPS Inspection Committee. That's a bit rushed, but th those are the key points because they all kind of play into what's happening, about to happen next. So everything then changes because France, on Bastille Day 1933, uh, annexes six of the Spratly Islands. Um, and this causes a major reaction uh, in demonstrations on the streets in China, uh, protests uh, from civil organizations, 
But it becomes, when you look at the newspapers, it becomes very clear that the Chinese government does not know where the Spratly Islands are at this point. So it has to send uh, requests to its diplomats in Manila and in Paris asking for maps. And we have uh, an account from the American geographer uh, in Manila uh, of a meeting when the Chinese consulate, consul, Mr. Quanling Kwong, comes to him asking for a map of the South China Sea to tell him where the, where the, where the Spratly Islands are. Um, and within a couple of weeks, it's clear that the government in Nanjing becomes aware that the Spratly Islands are not the Paracel Islands and decides not to issue a protest uh, to the French government because it's only interested in the Paracels. However, our man, Admiral Li Jun, returns to the picture uh, and gives interviews to newspapers uh, in Nanjing and elsewhere saying these are the islands that I discovered and claimed back in 1909 and it's disgraceful that the government is not standing up for China's rights. So he completely confuses the picture, giving interviews to various newspapers which, and, and, uh, which are amplified and repeated. And the Southwest Political Council, the rival government, uh, in, in, in Guangzhou use this issue to attack Chiang Kai-shek and so they generate the publicity, they generate protests but it's not the Chinese government, it's a rival government that are doing it. And the problem is a lot of the history that's been written subsequently uh, about the history of the South China Sea uses as their sources these newspaper articles which were written in 1933 and 1934 which are full of the confusion about the Paracels and the Spratlys and contain other mistakes but they have become the founding documents for a lot of uh, the writing of the history of the South China Sea and it, it's, it, it's very problematic. So at the end of the 1933 row about the French annexation of the, uh, the, the Spratlys for the first time really interest in these islands has become a national issue before it was really only uh, people in the south here it becomes everybody in Nanjing you get big protests um, it's really a kind of anti-imperial anti-French anti-Japanese to some extent uh, campaign um, and these newspaper articles are really critical for spreading ideas about who owns the South China Sea and it's also important to remember that the Chinese government the central Chinese government does not think it has a claim to the Spratlys in 1933 and its military council military committee uh, agrees that it's not going to press a claim. And then the Foreign Ministry um, uh, Gazette publishes an explanation for the Chinese reader who bothered to read it about why these islands are different and why China is not going to claim the, uh, the Spratly Islands in 1933. However, the Maps Inspection Committee continues its work. And one of the first things they do is um, in the South China Sea is produce a list of names, Chinese names for the features in the South China Sea. And this is important because it shows you about the sources that they're using. And if you can read the Chinese, you'll see that this initial list is simply the translation or the transliteration of the existing British slash European names. So for example, Spratly Island is simply transliterated as Sibalatuo, yeah, Spratly. One of my favorites is um, uh, Money Island, Jinyin Dao. It's the Chinese word for money, Jinyin, but it's actually named after a British uh, a manager of the East India Company, William Taylor Money. So they just took his name and, and, and translated it. Um, and this causes a number of problems. Now, what's interesting about this is there was no Chinese surveying work going on, and because there are mistakes in the committee's list which match mistakes in other lists, I can pretty much be sure that the committee copied this British list from the, South, from the China Sea Directory published in 1906. Using Google Maps, you can, it's our Google Books, you can simply kind of trace the misprints and only this one has the same misprints as the Chinese list. So they copied this British list in 1906. Um, or it was published in 1906. Um, and then in April 1935 the same committee publishes a map of the South China Sea with all the names in place. Now it's not clear to me that China is actually claiming everything on this map. Because for example, they've, just, they've created Chinese names for places in the Philippines which are not part of the, of, of the claim. It's simply a, a way of regularizing the maps at this point. And I'm open to, 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 to question on that point. But even as late as 1935, there still seems, seems to be no claim to the Spratly Islands. And in fact, the Spratly Islands are called the Twansha, the chaotic sand. James Shoal is important because it appears at the very, very bottom of the map down there. Um, and it's given the name Zengmu Tan by the uh, by the committee. Zengmu is simply the transliteration of James, J-M. But Tan is interesting because Tan means sandbank, a land feature, which it's not, it's underwater. 
So why, is the, why does the James Shoal become uh, important? Because it then becomes declared to be the southernmost point of Chinese territory, even though it doesn't exist. It's an underwater feature. Now, my guess is that why did they choose an underwater feature um, as, as, a, as a, something that was worth noting on that, is that I think, and this is my guess, the committee simply copied this British map published in 1918, which gives particular prominence to the James Shoal and to the Vanguard Bank and draws them with dotted lines. And so when a, um, and so the James Shoal there is, appears as a, a Zengmu Tan, Tan being a land feature. Um, this guy, Bai Mei Chu, he's, a, he's not part of the government, he's a geographer, professor of geography, a quite an important figure. Uh, he, in 1936, takes the work of the committee and print, prints it in an atlas for the first time to, uh, for sale for commercial. And you'll see that in his atlas, he marks the James Shoal and the Vanguard Bank as islands. And then he draws a line around them. So the U-shaped line that we can see was first drawn on this map by a private man, and he drew it in this way because he was trying to include islands that don't actually exist because he misunderstood the British map that he was copying. Yeah? So the sacredness of the southernmost point of Chinese territory comes back to some translation and cartographic areas in 1935 and 1936. So the, the situation kind of gets more chaotic because of the arrival of the Second World War. Japan occupies some of the islands. France is occupying some of the islands. Uh, one of the questions now that's often taught is whether the Cairo Declaration promised the Paracel and the Spratly Islands to China. They're not mentioned at all in the Cairo Declaration. But there is this line that all the territories that Japan has stolen from the Chinese shall be returned to China. The um, question is, could Japan be considered to have stolen the Paracels and the Spratlys from the Chinese? Well, certainly not the Spratlys, because there were no Chinese forces occupying or had ever visited the Spratlys at this point. Paracels depends whether you think that they were rightfully Chinese or not, because again, there were no Chinese forces there, but a claim had been made. There were definitely French forces occupying some of the Paracels uh, before the Second World War. So the Cairo Declaration is a very ambiguous document on that point. And the uncertainty you can see, even in a, this is the China handbook published immediately after the war, a uh, Ministry of Information document describing the country to, for foreigners. And you can see even there, the Spratlys are still known as the Tuansha, not the Nansha. Tuansha is chaotic sand. It's a translation of dangerous ground, the word that appeared on uh, British and other international maps. And saying basically the, this territory is disputed between China, the Philippines, and, and Indochina. It's these guys who were geographers. Importantly, they are both students of Bai Mei Chu, the guy who drew the U-shaped line in 1936. Um, they are geography professors. They go off to Germany and Japan in the 1930s to study geography. What kind of geography do you learn in Germany and Japan in the 1930s? Probably not the best sort. Um, and um, they come back to China with a determination to try and define the country's borders. And they are seconded to the Ministry of Interior to actually formulate once and for all where China's national boundaries are. And, uh, and Zheng himself, in his naval captain there, he goes on the very first Chinese expedition to the South China Sea in uh, late 1946. Uh, these guys, uh, and in the meantime, the Philippines gets independence and uh, uh, the Foreign Secretary makes a claim on the, on the Spratly Islands. That kind of adds a sense of urgency. It also a sense of urgency because the communists are regrouping and there's a sense that the nationalists have to, to defend uh, their national legitimacy. Now, the 25th of December um, on 1946, there's a meeting in the Republic of China Ministry of Interior uh, where they sit down to consider which parts of the South China Sea, which territories they are going to claim as China. And those two geographers there draw up this map. Uh, this is the very first time that a U-shaped line, nine dashes, or however many dashes it has, appears on a state document produced by China. Before they appeared in private documents, this is the very first time an internal document uh, for a meeting then. And you can see that the James Shoal is a particular objective. They seem to have just copied the line from Bai Mei Chu's um, uh, private map, 936. But there's, there, there are mistakes even now on the map. They've got the, they've got the name wrong, basically. Um, and the name is in transition. It's a sketch map, it's only used for internal purposes, but this is now on the Taiwanese uh, government archives, you can easily look at it. Uh, France gets in the game, and there's a kind of a race for the Paracels and the Spratlys uh, in late, late 46, uh, very early 47. Um, leaving the French 
uh, in charge, well, kind of occupying half the paracels and the Chinese occupying the other half, um, and uh, an uncertain position down in the Spratlys. That's the very first time any Chinese official lands in the Spratly Islands, 12th of December, 1946. So that's when the claim reaches the Spratlys for the first time. And in the wake of that, a map is produced. This is the one you've probably seen many, many times before, uh, drawn in December 47 and formally published in February 1948. Um, now, and again, we have the issue that the, you know, there's still a lack of clarity about the, the James Shoal. Its, its name is still being translated. The word Ansha appears to be invented at this time uh, to be an equivalent for Shoal because they've recognized that Tan is not the right word for Shoal in this context. Um, so, the claim is not ancient, but modern. It developed in response to political crises. In 1909, it was about standing up for the Qing against the rebels. In 1933, uh, it was about the Southwest Political Committee standing up against the government, central government in Nanjing. In 1949, it was about the nationalists standing up against the communists. Um, elite knowledge about the sea was pretty minimal, but then expanded southwards during the 20th century. So therefore, the claim itself is not a natural thing, but the result of particular circumstances at particular moments in the 20th century. I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much. All right, well, I expect that we're going to have perhaps a heated Q&A, but I'm going to start off with one question that, that jumps to mind, which is, uh, we, it looks like the first reference to Maxwell Bank uh, is pretty clear. I didn't see at what point Macclesfield Zhongxia was expanded to include uh, Scarborough Shoal, Huang Yan Dao. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's a good point, actually. Um, I mean, because the, the naming is interesting, because the, the, as far as I can work out, Pratas appears to be called Dongsha, Eastern Sand, uh, well before this. It's known as a fishing location. But the word Sisha, West Sand, seems to be coined in 1909 to be an equivalent to Dongsha. You have East Sand, and you have West, now we have West Sand. And then Macclesfield Bank appears as Nansha, Southern Sand, uh, initially, because it's a sort of, you know, a triangle. Um, and then it's only in 1947 that the Nansha is moved south to become the, to become the Spratleys, and then a new word, Zhongsha, Central Sand, is coined for Macclesfield Bank. Um, and, I mean, there's, no, there's simply no mentions of Scarborough Shoal in any of this, as far as I can see. And I think it's interesting that after the arbitration verdict came out, uh, China, the Chinese government put out a new white paper about its claims and couldn't identify in that, as I recall, a single piece of evidence in favor of a Chinese claim to Scarborough Shoal. It would, could talk about maps of the Nansha Islands or, ma or maps of the South China Sea Islands, but it couldn't say anything at all specifically about uh, Scarborough Shoal. Um, I mean, a few years ago, there was a claim, for example, that a 13th century astronomer built an observatory on the, on the Scarborough Shoal. Uh, you know, the Scarborough Shoal is about as big as this thing we're sitting on here, and the idea that somebody found it and kind of built... Uh, and, and interestingly, in 1980, the Beijing Review had said the same uh, astronomer built it in the Paracel Islands. So he's a very useful astronomer because he can be moved around the South China Sea to kind of claim things 700 years later. So, yeah, so there's, there's simply no you know, discussion of the South China Sea. I mean, even the name, I mean, the Chinese name uh, for Scarborough Shoal is, is Huang Yan, Yellow Rock. But that name was only given to it in 1983. You know, uh, in 1935, um, they simply transliterated Scarborough as Sigo Baolo, and that name, uh, and then in 1947, the nationalists gave it the name Min Zhuo, uh, I'm, excuse my pronunciation, Democracy Reef. And then in 1983, the communists thought that Democracy Reef sounded wrong, so they called it Yellow Rock. All right, let's open it to questions from the floor. Mira? Can you grab the mic? We have the webcast going. Thanks. Thank you so much for a really terrific talk today. I have about a million things I'd love to ask you, but I'll limit myself to one question. Uh, you showed us the fact that the 9 dash line would appear to have its origins in the map of a private individual in the Republic of China. Uh, but one thing I noticed about the transition from that being privately drawn with its errors 
uh, originating with the British map to the ROC official map that was uh, finally published in 1947 is that that's when we go from a solid line to a dashed line. Was there anything um, in your research about the 1946 to 1947 period that suggests why following the scramble for the Paracels, the line became dashed when it was finally drawn for official records? Um, I'm going to use uh, some work that's done by a, a Canadian PhD student uh, called Chris Chung, who's studying his PhD at the University of Toronto at the moment, and he's been looking at the minutes of the, th those meetings in 1946-47, and it seems very clear from, from what he's found is that this, uh, they were discussing which islands to claim. There was absolutely no sense that they were trying to enclose sea in that. And so it simply, uh, I mean, it's, it's there, I guess, using the geographical convention of the day, trying to show uh, which islands are being claimed. So it's no sense that it's, it's trying to enclose. Um, you know, why Bai Mei Chu chose to use a, a solid line it's not clear, except maybe he's just following the tradition of those earlier maps of national humiliation and sort of, you know, drawing a big line. That's all I, all I can guess. Up front. And Mara, thank you for your service, as they say in these things. It's been, uh, <laughs> thank you, Bill, <laughs> you for your talk. Sorry, I just wanted to say, Mara, you've done some fantastic stuff on this issue, so it's, uh, you know, it's great. Thank you, Bill, for your comments. Very informative. I'm David Rosenberg from Middlebury College oh, in Vermont. Right. Yes, you have a very good website. And uh, since we've raised the question of dashes, I'd like to ask you a little bit more. You showed us the 11 dash line, mm -hmm. now the 9 dash line, or some would say the 10 dash line. But what was the reason for the switch, the removal of the two dashes in the Gulf of Tonkin? Well, I mean, the, the story that's usually told is that this was a, a deal between the, the communist uh, brothers in China and the communist brothers in, in Vietnam. This is obviously before, this is 53, so it's before there's a, you know, a communist state in Vietnam, so it has to be some arrangement between communist parties, one assumes. Um, I mean, I haven't looked into it in, in great detail as to why they took it out, but I mean, it, in the end, it advantaged China, ultimately, in terms of the final um, uh, uh, settlement that was agreed in 2000. Um, I mean, at the end of the uh, Sino-French border war in 1887, there was a, an agreement, you know, the, the Sino-Tonkin agreement, which specified, um, you know, kind of a particular line that would you know, run basically north-south from where the, the land border ended, and that all the islands on that side of it would be Vietnamese, and all the islands on that side of it would be, would be Chinese. But when you actually look, and I, I have it on my laptop, the actual map that was attached to it, it's clear that it's not intending to kind of divide up the South China Sea, you know, because the actual scale of the map is only talking about islands which are about 100 meters offshore. Um, it's not intended to refer to anything outside the, the Gulf of Tonkin. And in fact, when Vietnam and China came to negotiate their boundary in the 1990s, they, they threw out that definition of the line. Um, and they started afresh uh, with, with, a, with a new set of things. So, um, precisely why the Chinese thought that was a good idea, um, I'm not sure. I don't know if anybody, I mean, do you know? Was but it domestic or international? I, I think it was about international solidarity because there was also, I mean, I'm stretching now, but there was a, for a time, the Vietnamese lent China an island to kind of look after for a bit during the campaign against the French to kind of, you know, sort of protect it from being occupied by France in the, in the Revolutionary War, if you like. And then the Chinese kind of gave it to them back in the 50s. So that may just have been part of these sort of, you know, these tactical things which were agreed between two fighting communist parties at the time, I think. But I'm speculating. In the back. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's a very interesting um, presentation. So it seems that the Chinese government is also adding the historical rights uh, in the present period with regard to its claims in the South China Sea. So I was wondering, in your research, uh, are there mentioning uh, any mentioning about the historical rights, for example, fishing rights, etc., during the ROC period or even before, such as in the Ming Dynasty or in the ancient Chinese times? Thank you. I can't find any mention of hi historic rights before 1990. Um, in terms of uh, rights to fish kind of in, in the, within the U-shaped line. And 
from my rough research, that whole idea seems to come out of Taiwan in the early 1990s and is then perhaps picked up by the mainland. Um, and I think it's an attempt to try to square the Chinese claim with the emerging doctrines coming out of UNCLOS, which we obviously agreed in 1982, and the recognition that UNCLOS wouldn't support some of the most expansive claims um, that were in the U-shaped line. Um, and I mean, there are, you know, kind of legal basis for claiming historic rights, but they are very limited in terms of you know, historic bays and, and this kind of thing. And there have been agreements between countries in the past. I think the UK and Norway have some agreements about historic fishing rights, for example. And you see those being deployed um, uh, in these kind of arguments. Um, but no, there's, I mean, there's very much, there are lots of discussions about the fact that Chinese fishermen use these islands and that that makes them Chinese, that's for sure. But they're only talking about the, um, uh, the islands themselves. They're not talking about rights in the waters around them. Um, that might reflect you know, the fact that uh, you know, the relative lack of sophistication of, you know, kind of international legal thinking in China at the time, or just the sense that you know, the sea goes with the land, and so therefore if they're ours, we ought to have the sea around it. I mean, I mean the thing about fishing is, by and large, you know, the, the bits a long way from land don't generally have many fish in them. Kind of, you know, fish tend to kind of live around coral reefs and shallow areas and all that kind of stuff. So I don't think people really fished in the, you know, that much in the deep water. You know, they were only looking at fishing in lagoons and, and, and near those, uh, those outcrops. So I think the question of kind of you know, owning the rights, you know, in the very deep water of the sea just, just wouldn't have occurred to anybody. Yes? Hi, uh, Ray Arnado, retired State Department and uh, now AAAS. Um, nice presentation, thanks. Uh, you have a book out, so we're heartened to buy it, I suppose. <laughs> um, simple question, you mentioned uh, the history of the Chinese claims and then a couple to the French claims. Has anyone else in the past made any claims to islands in the South China Sea, the, uh, the Philippines, um, the Brits? Uh, the Brits. We were there first. It's ours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 1877, I think, was the British authorities in, uh, in Labuan, Borneo, gave, you know, gave the rights to claim it to a... Again, it was guano that was the motivating factor. Uh, but then, like everybody else, did nothing to maintain it. And so, uh, never formally rescinded the claim, but I don't think anybody's thinking that they will make a big thing of it now. Uh, I think, technically, France is... France claimed the Paracels on behalf of Annam, and so that claim would have then passed to, to Vietnam, but it claimed the Spratneys on behalf of itself, uh, and so it's kind of ambiguous, although it, it incorporated the Spratneys into a coastal province of Vietnam uh, for administrative purposes, but it's, I mean, you'd need to be a, a lawyer probably to argue whether, you know, whether the French claim was passed to Vietnam uh, independence in 56, the Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam, or whether it continues in their own name. Japan obviously claimed them, but at the end of the Second World War, Japan kind of said no more. Uh, now, the Philippines one is interesting because, of course, Philippines was uh, under American rule during the first time of Spanish and then American rule. Um, but there are plenty of acts that were taken you know, during those periods, administrative acts, you know, anti-piracy, um, you know, kind of making maps, that kind of stuff, uh, which the Philippines could maybe claim. And obviously one of the first, as I showed, one of the first things they said after independence was that we claim the islands, but they didn't uh, go and stick a flag in any of them uh, until much later. Uh, so the, uh, the story that, I mean, I, I wrote about it because initially started to write about it because I just thought it was funny and uh, was, was Thomas Clomer, who was a Philippine shipping entrepreneur uh, in 1956, went and claimed the Spratleys for himself as his own country called Freedom Land. Um, and, uh, and then when Marcos got interested in the oil possibilities in the 70s, uh, Clomer popped up and said, actually, they're mine, whereupon Marcos stuck him in prison until he signed them over to the Philippines for one peso. Um, and until recently, the Philippines' claim was slightly based on the fact that, that Clomer discovered the islands in 1956. Thankfully, they've got a slightly more solid legal footing now. Um, but uh, there are, I mean, there are, and there have been sort of other individuals who have attempted to claim the islands for themselves. But, 
I mean, really, I think it's fair to say that in terms of sort of permanent presence, the Philippines only really got in the act in 1970, um, or, or thereabouts, um, as a state. Vietnam, Republic of Vietnam, partly in response to what Cloma was doing, uh, sailed around and stuck flags in some of them in 56. Taiwan also came back having left in 1950, uh, in 56. Um, so this is one of the things that one could try and unpick is that um, if, if you, I mean, you'd be fair, it wouldn't be that hard, I think, with a bit of research. You could work out which state stuck their flag in which island. And if you disaggregated the lot and stopped talking about the Spratleys, the Paracels, and you started saying, what about Ituaba? What about Titu? What about Spratly? What about this? You could fairly, I think you could pretty much work out, you know, Taiwan has had a fairly constant presence in Ituaba for the last, you know, kind of, you know, 70 years. Vietnam, but they haven't had a presence anywhere else. You know, Vietnam has occupied Spratly Island, Philippines has occupied Tutu Island, and as far as I know, they haven't been occupied permanently by any other powers. So you could probably sort of, you know, I don't know what other people think, you could probably resolve it like that. If everybody just agreed, you know, chill out, let's just have what we have, and, you know, <laughs> it'll be fine. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I'm Chinese from China. Yeah, uh, from Shanghai, actually. I'm a reading scholar at GW, and uh, I'm not uh, specialized in international law. I'm specialized in international and foreign policy. Your conclusion is here. You made the very remarkable, very uh, you know, and it sounds similar like you know some evidence China claim in modern time, but from Chinese point of view. In many, you know, it's, it's as you be, you have to look at back to the history. Uh, your conclusion here, why I cannot agree with you, because you, you said claim development, uh, development in the rebound of domestic political crisis is in the 1930s. How do you think about the Chinese in the, in the transition of the two century, from 19th century to 17th century? China is now the modern country. Chinese, in Chinese people, because I'm, I'm doing international relations studies, in Chinese people, Young students, actually in the 1930s, nobody had the idea of sovereignty. It belongs to the you know, Qing dynasty, the Qing family. So when you talk about the Nanhai, uh, how Vietnam, Philippines, all these things, all these things is, is uh, connected with Qing dynasty. So nobody said it's ours because it's ours. So when the after the World War, you know, World War I, before, you know, the many, you know, foreign, you, we call it the Western invasion to China. China, many claim, you know, saw, you know, the, the land because it was, you know, split by, similar like, particularly Japan. Taiwan, many, even, even German, you know, Sandong Peninsula, you know, was, was, was there, you know. So it's many problems when China is so weak. How China do that? Uh, it's ours because we cannot find tell because it's ours. So in the 19, uh, when you said the domestic political crisis, yes, I agree. It's, it's, uh, I think it's uh, in the Kuomintang uh, governments, it's wrong with the political because many people said we're anti Japanese, we're anti foreigner because we should protect ourselves. Now we realize we are more than we know sovereignty. So that from that time, I think you. Partly I agree with you, this domestic political crisis response from the government. But how do you, you know, can you back to the, another, maybe for 30 years back to the 1960 or 1980, even, even the, the, the eight, we call the eight countries, you know, particularly during the, uh, uh, the, the Boxer Rebellion period. We are doing in China, many people are really think the domestic affairs, how we, who control the country become a modern country. So Sun Zhongshan is doing the first. Then Kuomintang, Jiang Jie and Mao Zedong, civil war, then anti Japanese war. So this for 40, 30, you know, for the 50 years, China is doing this domestic war. How China have the capability and the idea of the sovereignty over South China Sea. So this is groundless when you say that this claim develops that just not ancient but modern. I cannot ch from Chinese. Maybe I think Chinese do disagree with you because it's different logic. We have to look at the history. I, I cannot uh, give any evidence for, uh, 
my I, your, because you are interested in the law, do that. To wrap it up. Yes. Mm. So I, this is my experience. I should have. A, I think we should have a Chinese voice here. <laughs> Thank you. Great. I mean, I think this. What's fascinating I mean, is you clearly feel it and you believe it. Yeah, and I and imagine an awful lot of people like you feel and believe the same way. But a hundred years ago, you wouldn't have felt that. Yeah, that it took. It, <laughs> but it, because. Because, you, because that's, that's what's interesting about these newspaper articles. When you read them, they are educating a population about a claim that they don't know that they have. And so they're actually generating a claim in the minds of the readers. You know, these are Chinese. Why are they Chinese? Because we found this sentence in a document which tells you that. But, these people, but the people reading the newspaper didn't know. They, they'd never heard of these islands before. You know, these islands were the places where pirates roamed and smugglers and things. They were places, you know, that one feared. One feared to go past them if you, if you sailed them. You, were, you wanted to keep the pirates away from your shores. There was no sense that these were places that one would want to, you know, fight for or anything like that. It's only in the context of, uh, you know, as you say, the Germans and the British and the French and everybody else uh, stealing bits of China that it becomes an emotional issue. Otherwise, you know, I mean, frankly, if, the, if, the, if these islands didn't exist, no one would care, really, would they? It's only because they exist and then they become a kind of test of strength and patriotism that then they become a big issue between the powers. It's, so what's interesting for me is kind of that, is almost the sort of psychological thing is about how people learn to care about these islands when they didn't care about them before, as you so quietly demonstrate. I mean, the fact that every single eighth grade Chinese pupil is taught, you know, that the James Shoal, the Xingguan Shao, is the southernmost point of Chinese territory, is a deliberate decision by the Chinese government to do that. Okay, how are they going to get themselves out of that mess? You know, why are you claiming a piece of, uh, of sea as territory when it's not territory? And just, just to bring this up to date, uh, for example, people are worried now about, uh, or some people in this town anyway, are worried about whether China might declare an air defense identification zone, an ADIS, okay, around the Spratlands. James Shoal gives China a big problem because China has a choice. It's either going to try and bring its claims closer into line with international law and draw lines around island features, you know, Spratly Island and Ituaba and whatever, and say, this is our ADIZ uh, or this is our, these are our straight baselines. And if it does that, it can't draw a line around James Shoal because James Shoal isn't an above ground feature. Yeah? So it has a choice. It either uh, includes a non existent land feature in its straight baselines, or it excludes what a billion Chinese children have been taught is the southernmost point of Chinese territory. Now that might seem a rather obscure thing, but I bet it's the kind of thing that bothers people in Beijing. You know, people have been brought up on this sort of sacred text. So yeah, you feel emotional about it, but it's, that in itself is an interesting question about why you feel emotional about it. And I think it's because you've been taught to feel emotional about it. Take the red pill. <laughs> <laughs> Don Emerson? Uh, Don Emerson, Stanford University. Uh, I wonder, Bill, if you could look back on your research and ask yourself this question. In the light of your research, was the decision of the arbitral court on the 12th of July suitable, not suitable. They really made what in many eyes I think was a radical statement that nothing in the Spratleys is an island. That has implications for the future, both for Taiwan, especially with regard to Ituaba, because I think many people expected Ituaba it would be the one case where there would be an island with a 200 nautical mile EEZ. So from your standpoint as a historian, could you evaluate the court's decision and its implications? Thank you, John. Uh, I'm a geographer, and I make no claims for history. But they, um, I mean, it, there are no records of any settled communities on any of these features ever. Um, you have descriptions of fishermen being left for, for example, a season you know, with you know, big pots of water and you know, sacks of rice to kind of you know, uh, stay there and maybe kind of cultivate or collect coconuts or whatever while their colleagues are out fishing nearby. But there are no settled families or, or anything like that. And since UNCLOS, 
which is obviously a, an artificial construct, but it was agreed by all the members of the UN uh, in 1982, specifically says human habitation, then they're not islands. Um, I mean, the fact that you can, you, know, you can fly in solar panels and desalination equipment, I mean, that, that's, that's not what it means, you know, that's not what the meaning of UNCLOS was. So they ain't islands in that sense, although of course, you know, we, we, we don't have a word in English, well, so we can talk about islets, can't we, or features, but um, we'll still call them islands. Um, so just, that just seems to be logical, and, and by extension, I think the same thing will apply to the Paracels. I mean, if Vietnam really wants to um, upset the Chinese, then they could bring exactly the same lawsuit and remove the word Spratly and put the word Paracel in, and presumably they'd get you know, a similar result. They won't do it, of course, because they don't want to upset the Chinese that much. Um, um, so yeah, so logically, I mean, in terms of the, the, the description of the features, that was the only conclusion that, that, that could be reached. Um, and in terms of uh, whether you know, UNCLOS allows for just drawing vague lines in the sea and claiming all the historic rights between them. Well, clearly it doesn't. That was the point of UNCLOS, was to stop countries doing that, to remove that as a basis for conflict between countries. And, you know, China negotiated UNCLOS. It was a great victory for Chinese diplomacy. It kind of marshaled, you know, non-aligned countries and other countries with, you know, coastal states with, that wanted to preserve their exclusive economic zones. To do it, that was the compromise they reached. Why is China trying to undermine UNCLOS? I don't understand. You know, the, the ruling said absolutely nothing about sovereignty other than you can't claim sovereignty you know, in wide, wide areas of sea. You know, China can continue to believe that every single feature in the thing belong, rightfully belongs to it. The tribunal said absolutely nothing about that. So why are Chinese officials deliberately misrepresenting what the tribunal said? Is it because they don't understand it or is it because they're just trying to divert attention? I, don't know. Okay. I think we have time for one more. Yes. Um, my question will be: um, Every government is trying to use the media to educate, um, to or influence uh, the public and their people. And how do you feel as a journalist? And um, <laughs> how how do you think? Um, how can the media um, be objective? and uh, help to help the people to understand what really happened and what is the truth and not just increase the tension. Uh. And by the way, maybe th there's an, an, another <laughs> part of the question is, uh, you mentioned about, they point out a lot of, um, um, that China misused the historical evidence, but how about the other countries? Because for, I think for, for me, I'm a Chinese and for some other Chinese, uh, who are here or watching your presentation will feel, wow, there's a, a British and, and just they are trying to just talk about the misuse of the hi historical evidence. Mm. Mm -hmm. Can well, you explain that? For once, the British aren't trying to grab territory in Asia, so it's, you know, hopefully we can be a bit more neutral about that. Um, but the, I mean, I mean the, the question you raise is a kind of massive question that faces all journalists, really. I mean, there's a thing called truth, you know, and, and what, I mean, if you, want to, to, if you want to communicate to an audience the story of the South China Sea, where do you start? Do you start 2,000 years ago or do you start yesterday? You know, kind of how much can you actually convey in any kind of description of the problem? Yeah? Um, there's always a balance between, you know, the attention span of your audience. You know, obviously you lot are prepared to sit here for an hour and, you know, talk about the history, you know, for that, for that time. But you are a very small fraction of the television or radio or newspaper or web audience. Yeah? Most of them just want to know, well, so, so what? Um, and in, when I first started writing about this, it was common to, for people to say, the South China Sea matters because of all the oil and gas under it. But that's not really why the South China Sea matters. That matters to, you know, as part of the story. You know, so the story has shifted to, it's all about the USA versus China and the kind of who's gonna run the world kind of stuff. And that's an easy line for journalists to hook in an audience, yeah? Um, and, but also it's, you know, for, as far as the Philippines or Vietnam was concerned, it's not really about that either. Well, I think that's part of the story. So, you know, you kind of, you frame, as a journalist, you frame the discussion in a way that you think is gonna interest your audience. So a Chinese newspaper is gonna sort of talk about our historic rights being violated because they know that's gonna get lots of Chinese clicks. 
Yeah? Whereas, you know, an American audience is going to, an American output is out there, is going to sort of stress, you know, China's threat to American interest in Asia or whatever. Europeans are kind of, uh, where's the South China Sea? Um, but the, um, you know, it's kind of, it's a bit like sort of, you know, um, you know, world trade and, and the rules-based, we, we like rules in Europe, you know, okay, threat to the rules-based order. But, but then you try to, if I try to explain to my mum what the rules-based order is, I'll be there for another half an hour or so. So we kind of use, you know, we use these shorthand, you know, things. So yeah, we have a responsibility to tell the truth, but, um, you, know, as, you know, as everybody knows, the truth is a rather big concept, you know, kind of evidence, facts one can talk about, balance and so forth. Um, but, you know, no one will ever be happy. I mean, you know, on any subject, people will have different points of view and say, well, you missed out that and you didn't include that and, you know, you're biased. Well, you know, that's always the way. All right. Well, thanks very much, Bill. If everybody could please join me. Mm -hmm.